Air Commodore Finn Monaghan isn't just the real life Top Gun, he's the Top Gun's Top Gun. For the past 30 years or so, he's been flying pretty much every plane a going for the RAF in the Arctic, over deserts, over jungles, through mountains, far out to sea. Alongside his OBE, yep, he's got one of them, he was also awarded the DFC, the Distinguished Flying Cross, for what he describes as a very interesting mission in Afghanistan. Although, incidentally, Bruce, his missus describes his DFC as his disregard for family cross. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll get on to that with him a little and, bit and later he, on. He was, a, he was a Harrier pilot, wasn't he, as well? He was. He was. Yeah. He's flown pretty much everything. Well, Finn, Finn went on to become the head of training uh, for all instructors across all three of the UK's armed forces. And he also uh, ended up as the commanding officer of the Red Arrows, although he assures me that as a younger man, he also drank his fair share of ale and burned his fair share of mess pianos. Uh, and I have a feeling he might still be able to go some now. I wonder if he... Actually, we'll have to ask him if he's ever drank any trooper. Uh, that'd be an interesting one, wouldn't it? Yeah, so, and uh, if not, maybe, why not? Maybe, Absolutely. yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So right. now, he only wants to go and write a bloody book on it all, doesn't he? I can't think of anything more boring. Shall no. we get him on, see if we can try and persuade him against the idea? Let's get him on, absolutely, yes. And listen, Bruce, I know what you like, you and planes, mate, so you've got to let me get a word in edgeways on this one, yes. all right? I know no, what no, you like. No, no plane spotting here, absolutely. All right. Yeah. Finn, welcome to Psycho Schizo Espresso, mate. Are you all right, Finn? I'm very well. Finn, I'm going to ask you a question. Obviously, you know, we'll come on to all your credentials later on, mate, um, what you've done. Um, but look, I'm going to start off with a very deep question. And that is, when you go up in those Harriers or whatever, those those tornadoes, how the hell do you take a p*** up there? <laughs> well, you know what, Kev? Um, someone's actually thought this through. Uh, no, And there is a really? very special device. Yeah. So there's all sorts of stuff that goes on, you know, before when you're going across the pond or something. Um where people don't drink too much the day before, you know, because they go, oh, you know, I don't, I don't want to have to go. But actually, we have a uh, now I can't remember quite the designation of it, but it's uh, it's uh, um, P Pack Zero One or something like that. And what it is, it's a bag, and inside the bag, cunningly, is a sponge. Right. Well, th- th- this is a better answer to this question than I actually thought they were. I mean, okay, yeah, go on. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, so there's a there's a special bag. It's a it's a it's a nightmare to use. Absolute nightmare to use because you've got to make your seat safe. You've got to unstrap, and then you have to use the device. And it yeah. is um, yeah, it's an interesting device to have to use. So people try not to use it, but fundamentally, well, because I, I it was... used to relax into it quite a lot. Yeah, because I was thinking about it, and I mean, I know for a fact, that obviously, you know, if you know, in a, you know, a, a combat situation, you have to eject. Um, they say you've got to be, you know, hydrated, don't they, um, before you eject. Yeah. yeah. So you know, the idea, the, the idea of just not drinking is is kind of, um, you know, you have got to be able to drink up. You have got to remain hydrated, haven't you? Um, so it was one of these things. So I didn't know that, but look, let me, let's push the envelope a little bit further. So what about? I mean, because there are female fighter pilots, aren't there? So how do they get round it? Well, the things have been developed for females as well, because obviously we've got uh, lots of female aircrew. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it's a sim- similar device, I understand, but I, I have obviously never used one of those. Yeah. No. <laughs> I've got to tell you, Kevin, <laughs> the, 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 the problem of, um, of, of how to take a pee um, whilst in an aeroplane without any facilities um, is not, you're not alone in the. Um, in the sky in, in terms of just being restricted to fighter pilots because even um pilots of of little private aviation aircraft that can go for quite a mm. long time you know three four hours right all of a sudden yeah. get caught short and um yeah you, you've you got to go you got to go so um if so what's the store in a, in a light aircraft then bruce what do you do just well, mob it out the door or something or no that? i used to keep an empty bottle and oh, just, right. uh, okay. I just keep an empty bottle and just like you know wiggle the uh, wiggle the end of the uh, appropriate tool into the uh, neck of the empty bottle and ah uh, and it was great but then of course 
on one occasion, my um, my then wife was up at like about eight, 9,000 feet in a little Cessna over the top of some mountains in Southern California and went, I've got to go for a pee. I went, um, right, okay. Um, well, there's nowhere immediate. Mm. I, we could crash uh, and you could go for a pee. I said, but uh, so she had a water bottle, like one of those flip top ones. So she right. managed to have a pee in a water bottle and stupidly, there's a little storm window. So I opened yeah. it, the side of this little Cessna, put the water bottle out the side of the window and opened the water bottle. Those of you who are physics students will know what happens next. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, I end up covered in pee. So the entire <laughs> content of the water bottle vaporized comes back through the storm window and hits me full in the face. So, um, yeah, that's it. The other thing that happens is sometimes I was once flying solo on a little twin engine aircraft and it, I was like really, really early in the morning and I was um, flying in, across uh, into Texas and I was on my own and I was desperate for a pee and I had nowhere, nothing to go in except there was an empty oil bottle right um yeah. that was there i thought i'll have a pee in that but then the problem is the neck was very very small i don't wish to boast but i mean it was like there's obviously you know it was all toxic bloody oil all around the end of it so you have to go and yeah. pee like from a distance you know um did you wait specifically till you got over texas to have a piss bruce i had no choice i mean, do you know how yeah. big texas is <laughs> yeah i know how big texas is. <laughs> but anyway yeah you know that's another what on the subject of 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 you know, um, bodily fluids and things like that. It is a fact which people shy away from a little bit, uh, of the stress of going into combat and, mm. and, and combat stress. And in during the Second World War and, and it, during the Battle of Britain in particular, some of the ground crew had to be um, quite diplomatic about cleaning out the cockpits, um, mm after pilots came back down from combat um, yeah. because it was very common for some pilots to to just wet themselves just ignore it just just from just fear and adrenaline and they just mm. get on with it and just go and do what they had to do and come back down and other ones were you know more solid based yeah. But both things happened on a regular basis and uh, people were just sort of diplomatic about it and like, uh, oh, well, you know, that's just the way it crumbles. Finn, did you ever have any moments when when you were literally shit scared? Personally, have I, was I particularly scared? I think what you, you've got to remember that um, a lot of the people who were um, put into, the, into the, the, the situation in World War II were... Um, were, were drafted into the Air Force at the time. Mm. And uh, so they sort of come from Civvy Street and they were thrust straight into the crucible of warfare. Uh, for me, there was quite a long old training program to get me to the front line. So, you know, by the time I went into combat, I'd been, I'd been in the Air Force for six years and I was used to doing lots and lots of training. And, and, and I think... Uh, uh, I remember the very first time I went off and did something in the Balkan Wars, uh, there was a lump in the back of my throat. And I remember looking down at the... Uh, so it started in my hotel room, actually, where we were, we were in southern Italy. It weird because we we're in a hotel and yet we were going off and flying over the Adriatic, air to air refueling, and then going into the former Republic of Yugoslavia. And um, so it's this weird double life, you know, where you're living in a normal civilian environment in, in a you know i mean the hotel wasn't that great but it was a hotel um and then i was standing there getting my flying suit on and there was a particular thing was happening and and on on the tv i saw jets taking off from my home base in germany and coming to reinforce us i kind of looked at this thing and i thought oh my god you know and then it's it cuts to another story about shipping now i have a mate who's in shipping and, uh, and I just remember looking at this this uh, this person who was in shipping and thinking, well, it, that person isn't going off into combat today. And then having a shave and thinking, Finn Monaghan, how on earth did you get yourself into this? You volunteered for this, my friend. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and kind of thinking, oh, having a you know, big lump in the in the back of my throat because I might not have been coming home that night. 
And then um, I got in the lift to go downstairs and I looked at myself in the mirror again and thought, oh man, what? how did you do this? You, you could have been doing shipping like your mate and just sitting there, you know, life goes on as normal. And th this was at the uh, that's a really crucial time with uh, Milosevic and, uh, you know, lots of discussions going on and uh, everything was a bit tense. Mm. And then uh, the doors opened and there were, there were the crew that I was going into uh, to the squadron with. I just thought, there we go, it's normal, let's go. And then all the planning and everything was completely normal. And then I got this feeling again, just as I got to the end of the runway, my leader took off and I was sitting there, I was a junior pilot at this point. I looked down at the throttle. I thought, right, you are about to put that that throttle forward and propel yourself to a place where there are people with lots of surface-to-air missile systems who really don't like you very much. <laughs> um, so there was a bit of a a, um, a thought in my head there. You know, there was certainly fear there, and to say there isn't fear would be would be wrong. But yeah, there was definitely fear. Um, but then the training kicks in and. Then, as soon as I push that that throttle lever forward, the whole mission absolutely fine, and that that's been the case throughout. And I've actually done quite a lot of combat over the years, and uh, it just becomes normalised. To be perfectly honest, you know. So uh, I remember then leading someone years later in Afghanistan, and looking at him. It was his first combat mission, and you know, sweating from the forehead and everything. And I felt completely relaxed, and I just looked at him and said, "Just follow me. You'll be fine. Uh, this is the <laughs> first one." get the first one over and done with you'll be you'll be great so how did you you said earlier on you know and you're telling your story about you know going into the um your, your first foray into the balkans that you know you you looked in the mirror and you reminded yourself that you volunteered you enlisted for this how did it all how do you become a fighter pilot then did you always want to do it <laughs> no no not at all kev uh so uh i so this is a little bit cliched and actually uh, uh du jour at the moment um in 1986 or 7, um, whenever that particular film came out, I watched Top Gun. And I, and I remember sitting there going, oh, that, that looks pretty cool. And then the next day, I happened to walk uh, into, uh, it was, I was in my second year at university. And uh, so, you know, I'd done all of the, uh, the, the freshest stuff the year before. Mm -hmm. And I happened to walk through the middle of this, there was, there was a bridge at my university and the, which had a few stalls on it. And, the, and there was this thing, free flying, come flying with us, you know, a big poster up with uh, two bulldog aeroplanes, one like this and one like this. And I thought, right, I'll, I'll give that a go. And uh, started chatting these, to, to these, uh, these people who were dressed in not kind of student gear, they were dressed in a jacket and tie, you know, and started mm. chatting to them and they, uh, they said, yeah, you come, come through to Edinburgh, uh, we'll, you, you get to learn to fly. And I said, well, how much will it? You know, you've said it's free. It can't be free. And they said, no, 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 absolutely, it's free. Um, and then it was only about halfway through the conversation I realised that this was the Royal Air Force. And, uh, mm. and I said, oh, come on, you'll have me going off to war before you know where you are. And there's this sort of, you know, <laughs> I, I, at the time, I, I, I didn't think that I would particularly want to do that. And, uh, and they said, no, 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 there's no obligation. And here I am, 35 years later, still in. <laughs> so it really, yeah. uh, really good recruiting tool. And, and the University Air Squadron is this, uh, you know, it's this unit that you have. A, and every university in the UK, actually, um, is covered with a University Air Squadron. And you go along and you, they give you free flying. Quite a few people, it's not for them, and they go off and do other things. But uh, I absolutely got the buzz for it then. Absolutely. And actually, there was a... Uh, the, the, the moment I said I am joining the RAF was uh, I was upside down and a tornado went right underneath me. <laughs> and I remember looking down at it going, oh, my goodness, that is so good. I could, and I had a job lined up with L'Oreal, actually, in, uh, in Paris, um, obviously sitting behind a computer with a, with a tie. I looked down at this wow. thing. I thought I could wear this kit forever, which is a flying suit. And I can fly aeroplanes. I think this is for me. And I watch this this aeroplane disappear into the distance. That was my that was my moment. I mean, Bruce, I don't know if you know the stats on this. I was checking it out. I mean, Finn kind of like puts a, a, a kind of a gloss on that, and you know, it, it obviously speeds up the process. Um, but the stats on this, Finn, correct me if I'm wrong here. That um, or a few years ago, anyway, used to be that for every three thousand applicants. 
who set off to be a fighter pilot, one succeeds. I mean, that's one in 3,000. I mean, you must have had, I mean, Bruce, amazing. I mean, you must have had something. I mean, some, I mean there must be something about you that is kitted out to be, a, to, to, to be a fighter pilot. Many people would have kind of like thought, well, yeah, you know, I can fly a bit or join the RAF, but one in 3,000 end up in your position. And that's, of course, just flying, flying, you know, fighter jets. I mean, you went on to, you know, command the Red Arrows and be the head of training for all flight instructors, I think, across all three armed services. So, Bruce, I mean, you're a commercial pilot. Yeah. I mean, do you do you kind of concur that there are similarities between flying commercial? So, so, you know, a lot of people might be able to fly and it does revolve around, you know, the assimilation of a lot of information and being able to apply it. But do you, I mean, we've had this chat, haven't we? There are also, I would imagine, you know, distinct differences between a commercial airlines pilot mentality and that associated with uh, with a fighter pilot. Uh, well, the ideal commercial pilot um, is, is not uh, the ideal... Um, Fighter mm. pilot and 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 vice and vice versa. You know now yeah, there are people. Yeah, I would imagine so. Now there are people who. Uh, I mean, I've flown with um, guys who were in the Falklands War who uh, were flying Harriers, um, and uh, Navy Navy guys. Uh, and you know, one guy was my skipper, and I was a junior first officer, and um, really really nice guy, very laid back, absolutely. Absolutely relaxed and by the by the book, but very relaxed with it. You know, no stress at all. I've also flown with um, ex chess pilots. Uh, similarly, as a first officer, and you know, there's a captain, ex chess pilot, absolute bloody nightmare. You know, mm. no attention to detail whatsoever. Didn't know any procedures. Made it all up, staring out the window. You know, just I. I complete nightmare to, to work with because you're you're expecting to work together as a team and in actual fact you know you've got like the wizard of oz sitting in the seat next door to you who's like you know pay no attention <clears> to the man behind the curtain and you just look at him and go what are you doing now what are you touching that what what is that you just done oh thanks very much for telling me you know so yeah. um it's um it's a uh, there's all kinds of different mentalities um out there and, and funnily enough when i joined the my my weird little RAF Squadron 601, which is a bunch of old mm. codgers who <laughs> hopefully hopefully do something useful. Um, uh, I had to go for an, an interview um, with, um, uh, I think it was like a couple of two stars and a three star in the room. I mean, there's no, no intimidation there then, you know. And, um, and one of the guys was um, Sir Glenn Torpy. Uh, was was one of the interviewees, and he made a comment which was really interesting because we were talking about you know fighter pilots and you know things, and uh, and he said, um, in his opinion, the guys that made the best fighter pilots were not the really flash guys; they were the mm. solid, consistent, steady as you go people because they would get the job done and they would want to come home, you know. Yeah. Um, which was an interesting one because it was not that dissimilar to um, some of the sort of one or two of the loonies that I flew with um, as commercial pilots. You'd go, <laughs> you'd be sitting next to a guy and you'd be thinking, blimey, I've got to keep an eye on you, haven't I? You know, um, mm. as a first officer. And then when you transit to the other seat, to being the, you know, the captain, in which case everything is all your fault. <laughs> Even if you didn't do it, yeah. you know, um, you just have you have a completely different perspective. But nevertheless, you know, you're you, you're then keeping an eye on the bloke next door, and you're keeping an eye on yourself, you know, to see if if you're dropping yourself into the shit um, while you're at it. So, I'm sure there are similarities, but the biggest difference, of course, is that um, in one aeroplane, um, you're absolutely determined that under no circumstances is anybody going to die. Uh, mm. And the uh, other circumstance is that you're putting yourself in harm's way um, and you might die. And that's kind of what goes with the paycheck, I'm going to guess, Finn. Well, well, also, Bruce, also, I mean, just as big a difference as well. And Finn, I wanted to come on to this at some point, so we might as well do it now. 
I mean, commercial airlines pilot, you're right. The idea there, if I'm not mistaken, is, is yeah, to keep everyone safe, to get people from A to B as safely as, as possible. Um, and I think Bruce had touched on it as well. When, when, you're, when you're a commercial airlines pilot, you're, you're making decisions very much in a measured, considered way and doing it by the book. Um, however, if you're f- flying a combat aircraft, you know, you're, you're dealing very much with the unexpected all the time. Um, and you're having to make, I suppose, unilateral decisions, if I'm not mistaken, again, very, very quickly. Um, so there's there's two differences there. But I think, I think you know, yeah, you're trying to keep everyone and yourself safe. But also, I would imagine one of the biggest differences of all is as a fighter pilot, you're also prepared to kill people. Um, whereas commercial airlines pilots, well, you're not. But, I mean, to put it crudely, to be a, a you know, top fighter pilot, have you also got to have, you know, a killing ability as well? Well, I think it's it's pretty clear when you, and that's one of the questions that I was asked in my interview right at the beginning, um, you know, would you be would you be prepared to do that? And, uh, and uh, you know, I've, I've done a lot of combat operations. Uh, the use of lethal force, uh, is is something that uh, that that all all and and my specialisation was close air support uh, in the Harrier, and uh, and close air support is where you are protecting ground troops, uh, usually from from attacks that are that are very close in. So it's very very dynamic situation where you take off and you don't necessarily even know where you're going to if you if you go on a scramble. That sounds like Ryanair, mate. <laughs> But we scramble, get there, and then the, there is in, an inherently confused situation on the ground. So you, you need to be able to deal with uh, with complexity. Uh, you need to be able to deal with the fact that things are changing all the time. And you need to try to decipher what is going on on the ground, usually with people who are being attacked. Um, and they wouldn't have called for you if they didn't need you. Yeah. And so that has been the feature of many of the the situations where where I've been asked to use lethal force. Uh, now, there is a whole legal framework around all of that. It's called the laws of armed conflict. Um, mm. And out of the laws of armed conflict, you 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 produce rules of engagement for each theatre that you're in, and they're different for for each theatre. Yeah. And uh, and you're not just thinking about the the adversary. You're thinking about friendlies. And the fact that you do have these weapons that, that that can kill people, so you need to think about your your friends, and you also, of course, need to think about um, innocent people who are who are nearby. Mm. And so, each attack that you do, uh, you do what's called a collateral damage estimate yeah. calculation, and you are looking at you know that you you know the hemisphere of uh, of, of, of weapon damage that, that occurs using weapons. So, lots and lots of things going through your mind. Um, was I prepared for that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, again, it's it's this long period of training, uh, and all the way through that whole training period, it's uh, you, you're learning how to deal with uh, collateral damage estimate calculations. You're learning how to deal with uh, with the delivery of weapons and things. Um, was I ready mentally for uh, the first time that, that that I dropped the weapon with with uh, with lethal force and lethal, with a lethal outcome? Uh, no. Uh, because I don't think anyone ever can. No, no. Um, how do I feel about it? Well, I, I know that every single weapon that I that, that I've dropped and every single engagement that, I, that, that I've been through, um, I absolutely comply with the rules of engagement, and uh, and and that's really important. I think to know that you that you have a predetermined legal framework that you can go and that that, that you're go, going off and doing something, and. You know, in Afghanistan, for example, it was all, all, all based on uh, on self defence, the inherent right of self defence or extended self defence. So, people, I was I was dropping weapons, defending people on the ground, and that you know, in various instances, there were um, NGOs uh, or people who were uh, under attack. So, people who, who, were, who were doing things on the ground, and you know, that's that was really important. I think as a as a sort of a mental crutch for me. Uh, you know, you, you, you're doing the right thing because it's already been predetermined legally. Now, of course, there are legal loopholes in, in anything that, you know, you, there are always situations where, oh, my word, you know, what do I do now? Yeah. Um, err on the side of caution. You know, you don't drop a weapon if you, if, if you don't think 
uh, you know, it complies with your rules of engagement. But we used to have, funnily enough, we used to do a Met brief. And after the Met brief, you do the uh, technical question of the day, emergency of the day. And in the uh, when, whenever I've been off doing operations, we would also have rules of engagement question of the day. So testing your air crew to make sure, and I was the episode of the squadron in Afghanistan, for example, mm-hmm. testing the not the legal knowledge of your uh, of your air crew to make sure they're absolutely on the ball with that legal stuff. And you know, to put it in perspective, the uh, the rules of engagement are about that thick. You know, they, they're yeah. big, complex legal documents, and you've got to know that stuff inside out, absolutely inside out. And because if you don't, if you get it wrong, you can derail a whole campaign. You know, um, and and it's not good when you get it wrong. Uh, you know, apart from anything. You, you enter into the territory of war crimes and things like that. Sure. And, uh, that's something that, that we clearly don't want to get into. Were there moments of reflection where you kind of look yourself in the mirror and, 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 and wonder what happened, you know, when you dropped the bombs or, the, or those kinds of things? Does it play on your mind at all? Oh, it does. Of course it does. It's, um, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, that there is, there is another combatant, not quite like me, but similar to me, Mm. Um, who has signed up to do something in a similar way that I have, whether that's uh, as a as an insurgent, whether it's as a um, as, as someone who's who's in uniform. Um, you know, they've all got families, haven't they? You know, and 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 I felt an incredible amount of compassion for people, mm. noting that um, that they are on the other side, and. And in my case, a lot of the time, they were quite happy to, you know, I, I would arrive in an area and there would be, as a close air support pilot, there would be people on the ground who are fighting valiantly against these these other people. And they were quite happy to kill them. So, you know, it's either, you know, whilst, whilst they can shoot me, they're also shooting someone down below. And I think the motivation for me actually was was more, I am protecting people to protect that person. I if I don't do something, someone else loses their life. And to be honest, I think I think there's a there's an indoctrination process that happens from the moment you start marching up and down a square and yeah, polishing bits absolutely. of brass and stuff that that inculcates selflessness in you. And so, so for me, it's the protecting thing that was massive, absolutely massive, and still is in in my career. And going out there, I am quite happy to put my life on the line to save someone else's. So, so, so Finn, um, th- there's a couple of points there that are interesting. I mean, the um, obviously when you you are individually um, in an airplane, uh, dropping a weapon, uh, being shot at, uh, full of all the adrenaline and everything else that that provokes, fight or flight response, and you grin and grip through it, do the job come home deep breath decompress um in a way it kind of makes sense because you've done something incredibly violent but it also makes sense because people would have done other violent things to other people and also people are trying to kill you and they didn't and therefore it makes sense but with the whole world of um of drone operators Mm. uh who are doing exactly what you did but as you alluded to before they're in not necessarily a hotel in italy going down and having a nice breakfast in the morning they're going home to the wife and kids having done something they can't speak about that they've had no fight or flight reaction or if they have they can't do anything about it because they're stuck in a comfy armchair in an air-conditioned building Kevin, are you enjoying this episode? I'm absolutely loving it, Bruce. The thing is, um, is that most people won't get to hear a lot of this episode because they, yeah, they're not they're not patrons, and and but we've extended that whole thing now. So if you want to hear uh, this the content that we're going to do in the next bit and the kind of unfiltered version, well, of any of the podcasts really, um, yeah, you can get it on the Patreon page. And you can also get it now on Spotify subscriptions, I do believe. Um, you just search for the Psycho Schizo Espresso Double Shot. And it's, um, it. how much is it? Two quid a pop, isn't it? Two, two quid, quid a pop, quid, something like two that. Two quid a pop, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. it's two quid. Unedited, unfiltered, yeah. Uncensored. 
anything but anything but uneventful. Anything but uneventful. Yeah, if you can say it's, it's the hardcore, hardcore stuff. You won't regret it. Finn. Finn, I hope you don't think this is a flippant question, mate. But I mean, is it possible to get you know a bad day in the air? I mean, obviously, a very bad day is when you don't come back. But I mean, is it possible that you go up sometimes and you just think, oh, I don't know, this is a bad day at the office, the timing's out or whatever, I don't know, whatever it is in training, and you just think, no, it's not happening today. Absolutely. I mean, there isn't a mission that goes exactly to plan, ever. Right. So every single mission has something that happens, and, you know, there are degrees of, I mean, you can have an absolute nightmare. Um, you know, the weather's rubbish, the tank hasn't pitched up at the right time, or you haven't made it to the tanker on time. Um, right. Aircraft broken on the ground before you get there. Or or an air, the worst one is actually where you, you've got a slight snag and you're trying to sort it out and there's a check-in time. And, and, you know, and if you're part of a big, big mission, which is a big NATO mission, for example, you know, you're trying to get get up on the right radio net, you're trying to get your jet, and then there's a snag with the data loadout or something, or you can't get yeah. your data to load with a, with a brick. And, you know, you can have absolute nightmares. And, and you know, sometimes you, you come back and you go, right, you sit in that in that debrief room and you uh, uh, a whole load of honesty needs to happen. And, yeah. and exactly as Bruce says, you know, the, the, the air crew debrief, you can take it all the way back to someone called um, Major Smith Barry in 1916, who said, we need to understand what goes wrong on our flights and hmm. out of that came uh, the air crew debrief which became a structured debrief so it's, it's done in a certain way it starts with uh, with aim did i achieve it or not and then the next line is safety right at the top of the debrief let's talk safety in red and you go around the room before you even start talking about the mission itself was that safe and we even do that on operations as well um and that is all part of, you know, so I can, I can trace back to, to 1916 where we started thinking about safety. And that, and actually his stuff came about because they were smashing airplanes into the ground mm. in training, mm. not even in combat. Mm. And, yeah. and that's where we've then had various iterations of reinforcing things, reinforcing things. And then we also, Bruce, used the term the just culture. Yeah. Um, and, and as Bruce says, it's not just the air crew. You know, the air crew are a tiny part of, they're just the, the pointy end of an aeroplane, that's all. Uh, there is a whole network of all of the different trades and branches that, that, that are required to bring this whole, that, to take that machine and put that person in the aeroplane and get them to go and do stuff. And of course, it's not just the fighter jets, you know, they, they are all supported by other aircraft doing other things. So airborne early warning, you've got rivet joint looking at things and and assessing the battlefield you've got uavs looking at things i mean it is a it, it truly is a big big joint job and when it comes to safety we're then looking at uh, you know we i am relying on someone who actually is nothing to do with the aviation side of, of mm. something every now and then we get someone we give them what's called a good show if they are you know using good old battle of britain terminology a good show um but yeah. we give people a good show if they've cycle past an aircraft and thought that looks wrong because there's a flap open mm -hmm. uh, on the side of the aircraft there's a panel open and and someone cycling around the airfield spots it and reports it and actually you know we have had instances where people who are just paying a little bit more attention and not walking past something you know that culture yeah. of looking at yeah. it and thinking oh I, it's yeah. better that i ask and you know and and sometimes people you know it's something completely normal and but, you know, we'll still pat them on the back, go, thanks for taking the interest yeah. in that. And then, you know, there, there are things like, you know, putting hydraulic fluid into a tin uh, or into a jet where the oil should Oh, my go. God. Now, that's a catastrophic oh. Oh, yeah. mistake. That happened to Concorde. Yeah. That happened and, to Concorde. You know, th that kind of thing, just a very simple cognitive error made by someone yeah. can have catastrophic results. And how do we do that? Well, we try to build systems because someone goes oh I, I did this and sometimes you know it's like oh my good right stop ground the aircraft right we need to sort out a system and there's a there's quite a simple way of doing business with that we actually have uh, a different shape of can for a star yeah. but then also a different size screw thread so you can't physically do it but yeah. you know, back in the day it happened yeah and and learning from these things is is how we and particularly you know i, I really like this idea of uh uh, that, that we have that we're really trying to encourage, which is 
um, an almost happened thing that you report. That, yeah. That's really important. yeah. But but you know the uh, go, going going back to the the roadie. Now it must be fascinating, Bruce, because you see two systems there. Um, you know, flying mm -hmm. and that relationship that you've got with the roadies, because, you know, this is split second stuff. You can't get it wrong, can you? You know, the, a guitar in the wrong place or, oh, oh yeah, uh, you know, yeah. a pyrotechnic that doesn't go off at the right time. Or the pyrotechnic that, that goes, off, it goes off when you're standing over the top of it. You know, that's the, that's, that's the, that's the yeah. worst case scenario, you know. Tell me that has never happened, Bruce. Uh, well, it did happen, actually. So, so oh. I, I like being quite close to, 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 flames and things um because uh, it looks good and uh you know and it's sometimes it's a bit cold up there so it's just like warm your hands you know but um yeah. we we want to we had some some pyro like flash poof, things going up so anyway i was standing over one at the end of a, the the show and um this thing went off up my ass so i was like whoa and jumped about six feet in the air and i'm on this quite narrow platform so i nearly fell off my perch and um and then, uh, but it gave me a, an idea because I, the pyro guy was like, oh my God, he said, are you okay? I went, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, but did it look funny? He said, mm. well, no, I was, <laughs> no, 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 no. I said, not, not a trick question, not a trick question. I said, did you for a moment look at that and look like you'd blown up, blown yeah. up my backside? I said, was yeah. it funny? Like, you know, like, like comedy, Keystone Cops, Buster Keaton, funny. He went, it was a bit funny, actually. Yeah, I went good. So here's the plan. What we're going to do is we're going to have a chain of pyros, right? And I'm going to just take one step, and I want you to blow up the pyros in sequence and make it look as though you've blown up yeah. a pyro up my backside. And then we'll have a big box like Wiley e. Coyote that says TNT on the top of it with a big plunger. <laughs> and right at the end of the set. You, I will go bang, oh, bang, oh, bang, oh, and then boom, and I'll blow up the whole stage set. So that's how to come up with an idea from yeah. some misfortune, and it works brilliantly. We do it every night; it's great fun. <laughs> what doesn't kill, what doesn't kill you makes you absolutely, stronger. absolutely. You know, so life throws lemons, make lemonade. All the best ideas, you know. And I've seen you wear a, a, a wave of you flags around on 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 stage, mate, as well. Oh yeah, so yeah. I, I know you're no the stranger. Old Union flag around, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're no stranger to the old ensign. No. Um, listen, why not? I've never asked you this. <laughs> so obviously you can fly planes. Had your life taken a different turn, and you joined the RAF? Yeah. Would you have fancied your chances as a fighter pilot? Would you have gone for it anyway? Um. Well. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, yes. from knowing yes. you knowing yes. you as i do there yes. is only there is only one but possible i talked answer myself to that out of it because when i was at um when i was at school um the um uh if you were in the army if you were in the the army section right um and i was uh what i and then the CCF, Army Cadet Force, whatever. If you're in the Army section, and I was quite high up. In fact, me and my mate, he ended up as a colonel in the Highland Regiment, and uh, I ended up as not. Um, but we were both the same rank, under officer or whatever it was. And that meant that we could go and draw um, bulleted blank ammunition, thunder flashes, two-inch mortars, smoke grenades, and uh, Bren guns, and go and have a little war every Wednesday afternoon up in the woods. Um, which is ridiculous at the age of 16 or 17. I mean, we'd never be allowed now. I mean, it was mental. I mean, what we were doing. I mean, highly unsafe, but bloody good fun. So I was thinking about joining the army. Um, mm. And uh, I did. I went to uni and did history and became a rock star instead. Had I known that you didn't have to be any good at maths to join the Royal Air Force, you just needed the right attitude and if you needed to know anything about mathematics, they'd teach you. Um, I, I would have given it a go, but I didn't. My uncle was in the Royal Air Force. You know, my, my great really? uncle was okay. in the Royal Air Force. You know, they were both flights, uh, flight engineers. And uh, yeah, so yeah. my great uncle was in World War Two, flying eventually um, Liberators, uh, long range sub hunting, 200 squadron. And um, my oh, yeah. uh, other uncle, Chris Dickinson, was on... Uh, 
uh queen's uh queen's flight in the end um so he was vc10s and hooks and line them and then That's finished right. up uh with on ba 747s and then somewhere else he retired twice you know couldn't keep away from it all you know but uh <laughs> never bothered being a pilot because they said well, we can turn you into a pilot he said no stuff that i'm a flight engineer i actually know how it works um my son is a musician he's in a band um, he's just he's just doing his A-levels right now, actually. And uh, he, he said to me last year, so he's in a band, he's doing music at school, and he, he he's applied to do music and Russian at, at uni. And uh, But he's having a year off next year. And he said, uh, halfway through the year, he said to me, uh, yeah, the thing is, I, I don't think I'll, I'll, I'll need to go to uni. I said, oh, why is that? And he said, well, in my year off, you know, we've got a whole year. And, uh, I mean, the plan, Dad, is that... Um, well, we're going to be rock stars by then, so I'm not going to need to go. And I, and I looked at him and I started to open my mouth and he said to me, hey, Dad, did anybody ever tell you that you couldn't do it? Because the chances mm -hmm. of you getting it were pretty slim. It's kind of a similar world, mm -hmm. you know. It is. So, Dad, don't try and shut my dream down. And I went, yes, yeah, son, you go for it. Yeah, absolutely. It, go for it. And, it's you all, know, hey, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work it's out. It's all about it's all about self-belief. Uh, nobody, when I wanted, yeah. when I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to go and, d and, and do this and people sort of go, uh, what, what makes you think that you can do it? I said, I just think I will. And, um, yeah. I was like, yeah, you know, cause rock stars need to be tall, skinny with blonde hair. So I'm short, uh, with brown hair and, uh, that's it, you know, but so I, I don't look like the archetype of rock star, but actually that's like nature's cattle prod that just like spurs yeah, you on. So yeah, yeah. I am going to yeah. do yeah. it. You know, I think Ian Jury said something, something like the same thing, actually, Bruce. And I mean, you know, you just got to look at Ian Jury. I think it was exactly the same for him. And the really nice thing actually is that um, my son is in a band um, with my best mate's son. They, they, they were babies <laughs> together. So it's, it's Dunk Mason who, who was the boss of the battle of Britain Memorial flight, who, I'm crossing the uh, the Sahara with in an in a um, in the in the Sahara Banger Rally at the end of this year. Ah. We're, we're raising some money for uh, for a cancer charity and stuff. But the this vehicle is painted on one side. It's a Spitfire, and on the other side, it's a uh, it's a Lancaster. It's been painted by a, a company called Vintage Fabrics. And what uh, what's the vehicle? Aircraft. What is it? Uh, it, it's a Nissan Cross Trail, and and you you the rule was I think you had to spend less than a grand on the vehicle. So we will not get home. I mean, we will end up in the middle of the Sahara, but right. you know it's going to be fun. And then we've got um, uh, never never forget on the unless we forget on the uh, with yeah, bunch right. of poppies on on both uh, on the middle bit. Yeah. It's fabulous. And uh, but Dunk Mason and, and I'm going with another guy called Smithy, who is also another former boss. Uh, uh, Battle of Britain, uh, uh, BBMF boss. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, the fact that we've got these two sons, they kind of grew up, they both got into guitar separately. Um, my son plays violin and various other things, plays drums and stuff. And so they, they're kind of, they've, but for them, the access is very different from what it was in your day, Bruce, because they're on Spotify. Yeah. And they're chuffed to bits that people are listening to their music. Whereas, you know, so they, they don't have to go through a record label to actually get themselves kind of out there, which I think is an amazing thing. Finn, tell Bruce the story. I, how can I get you to tell the story the without story. giving it away? What it story? was the story when um, basically you didn't need the keys in the end. Do you know what I'm talking about? You didn't need to turn it off. Didn't need the keys. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, go on, uh, mate. <laughs> run with that. So th this... Bruce, this, listen to this. Yeah, this was actually my... Uh, um, so So... When I was awarded my DFC, uh, so this Distinguished Flying Cross, uh, I was I was airborne. I, I got airborne, and my wingman had, uh, had had broken, so he he'd stayed behind. <clears throat> I was now on my own. There are a whole bunch of rules about what you could and couldn't do because suddenly you're just on your own in the middle of uh, of Afghanistan. So there were height limitations; you couldn't go below. Um, and they'd only just about three or four weeks before approved singleton flight. So I was going off. I was just doing some support. So a special forces bloke on the ground who was uh, uh, he needed some things checking out from the air and a verbal transition uh, transmission down to him. So it was a, a bit of a chat, really, you know. And I was looking at things through my my targeting pod, uh, looking at various things that he that I could then relay to him. And then suddenly I got this call on the radio, 
hey, uh, go to this location and contact this call sign. And I did, and uh, and there was this uh, uh, immediate request, and you could I could hear this tremor in. It. They'd been fighting for about six hours. They'd had um, all sorts of. Uh, they're running out of ammunition. They really needed some some support. <clears throat> so, uh, so I ended up going and finding the finding the position, conducting mission, uh, and I actually touched on it earlier on. So uh, I struck a target that helped them out from from one area because they were getting uh, getting all sorts of uh, fire um, with RPGs. So we we took that out, and then uh, and they they were still getting fire from a compound, and uh, I couldn't see what this was. So I dropped down had a look, could see lots of ground fire coming up from another place because clearly they've now, they, they can see me and they clearly would like to have a shot at me. So lots and lots of ground fire coming up. Um, identified that position, relayed it to this other team who, uh, who then said, okay, well, that's your target then. Went back up, went to drop the weapon and, and they were getting really tense because they were now completely out of am ammunition, uh, trapped in, a, in an area and couldn't get out. They couldn't get back to a road to, uh, to get out. So uh, they needed me to take out uh, this, uh, th this position from this particular axis. Um, I, this is when I start getting, doo -doo 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 -doo, look down. I am now below my fuel for getting home. You know, it's thought provoking. Mm -hmm. So then um, <laughs> I went to deliver the, the, this particular laser guided weapon and uh, I had a failure that happened once in a blue moon, and it had it chose to happen at that particular time where it wouldn't lock onto the target. Um, I came off, said off drive, and I had this almost blood curdling uh, uh, disappointment that came from the guy on the ground. You know, this this to them was right. This is terrible. And I said, look, I've got two options. One, I can spin out. I can go a long way back. I can get the targeting pod on, and I can drop this weapon guided or I can go for another one where I will drop the weapon unguided and then I will get my targeting pod back up and I'll target the uh, the uh, this uh, thing for you. It's called a dive toss. Very, very rapid uh, thing, but, you know, chance of failure. And the the enemy were very, very close. So it's about 250 metres to, uh, mm. to friendlies. This is very, wow. very close. Wow, yeah. And the guy said, yeah, let's go for that. So now I'm in that sort of, awful position where effectively I'm bombing their position and I'm doing it with an unguided weapon as well. Uh, and I just said, request ground commander's initials. They give me the approval. And this is where I then drop the weapon and the weapon guided. Oh, I, got, I managed to get the weapon to guide with about six or seven seconds to go onto the target. But up to that point, while it's flying, you know, I had in the back of my mind, hey, you, you're on the front page of the Red Tops tomorrow. You know, this is not this is not cool. It really isn't cool. Mm. Felt very uncomfortable with the whole thing. Now, I've I've now been below the the uh, the the hard deck uh, a few times to uh, to find the, the these guys on the ground, but then also to uh, to um, to to find the target. I've been shot at quite a bit, so I've broken a bunch of rules there. I dropped an unguided weapon. That was another. I mean, that was just you just don't do that. Um, but it worked, right? It worked. Mm. And I felt a moral obligation to do it. Because if I didn't do it, they were just going to die anyway. And how yeah, do you sure. want to die? It was almost the question. There, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 was the, it was the biggest dilemma in my yeah. career, actually. The biggest dilemma. I then, interestingly, there were a couple of guys who'd scrambled from the base and were now come screaming towards me. Um, they were trying to get in touch with me on the frequency I'd previously been on. Obviously, couldn't get me on that. Mm. And uh, then I heard uh, a guy called, so Scram Bag was one of them, the Navy pilot, and Nick Knack was the Air Force pilot. And Nick Knack came up on the on guard, which is the uh, yeah. the, the safety. Yeah, 1715, yeah. Two. And, uh, yeah, uh, 243. Oh, 243, UHF, oh, yeah, and, okay. uh, yeah. It, yeah, 243, yeah. So on guard, I hear Nick Knack saying, um, uh, XO, XO, uh, it's Nicknack. Finn, Finn, it's Nicknack. <laughs> and I, I, this is at the moment critique. Just some about. It's just I'm going down the dive, and uh, and I said, Nicknack, I am trying to drop a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> but what I didn't know is that that Cy, th this other chap called Scramback had come and formated on my jet as I was going down the dive. And he wanted to come up and wave to me to get me to listen on the frequency. So I, I was going level. He joins in formation on me. I haven't seen him because I'm pretty focused on what's going on on the ground. And then 
we go into the dive and suddenly this bomb comes off. And it's like, oh my God. Because you don't want to be in close formation when a bomb goes, because every now and then they do go banag when they come off mm. the uh, the jet, not very often. So this whole thing was just this almost comedy, but at the same time, you know, I'm breaking rules left, right and centre. and uh, But I've got to get these guys home. That's in, that's my mission set. And I was quite happy to go flying around in the in the missile hemisphere in in reach of AK-47 to do it. You know, this is what we're talking about earlier on, isn't it? You know, the the idea that I don't actually care about my outcome. I'm now, and I've got this this aircraft going, you're out of gas, you're out of gas, you're out of gas. Anyway, I pulled up to, um, pu- pulled the jet up, got up to about 20 odd thousand feet and looked down and I just had this cold feeling that came over me as um, the, uh, the fuel was on something that I would normally expect to see when I'm in the hover in a Harrier just about to land. And Kandahar was about 70 kilometres away or so, or 70 miles away, actually. And I just turned towards the base, and I was quite high now, so I now started gliding, thinking, well, I'm going to have to eject. And I was watching this fuel, and I was, I was thinking, well, when do I do it? Do I do it? Do I do it now? Do I do it close to the base? And I got to the base, and the engine's still going round. I thought, okay, uh, I'll go for it. Now, there is, a, there is a zone there between, I'd say, about 300 feet to, to, to surface. If the jet had, had failed then, then you get such a rate of descent, I probably wouldn't have overcome the, by ejecting, wouldn't have overcome the rate of descent of the aircraft. So right. I'd probably have ended up dying in it. So there's a, no, there's a death corner, really. And, and I was looking at no fuel on my, on my fuel counter. So I then taxied back in. So landed. I'm still alive. The jet's landed. I taxied back in. I'm looking at fuel that I've never seen before in the jet. And I taxied back in, got to the, the aircraft hide, went round the corner. And just as I got onto the chocks, ordinarily you, 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 you turn the aircraft off using the, the stopcock. And uh, I didn't need to do that. It just went, now, Bruce, you'll know <laughs> the fuel burn <laughs> on the ground is virtually nothing. Yeah. So... Had I been probably another mile away, I would have, I, I'd have crashed yeah. um, or or ejected, whatever you know. Um, but you know, I thought actually looking back, I think that was pretty good fuel management. Yeah, a wonderful <laughs> yeah. story, a yeah. wonderful. There is- story. But then yeah. I did think, I did think that. Um, so my boss happened to, be, so he was waiting at the jet for me as well, and he'd been listening to this whole thing going on in the special forces hut, and. Uh, I got out of the jet, and I don't think to this day he's aware that just how low my fuel had got there, because he was more focused on all this other stuff that had happened. I just remember him saying, looking at me and saying, that was serious close air support. <laughs> and he said, write down everything. He was quite serious as well. You know, he's looking at me, write down everything. Everything goes in the misrep fin, good and bad. And it's about a year later, I was over in the States on an exercise, and they'd, they'd manoeuvred it so that I was on the, uh, the authorization desk kind of running all of, the, all of the operations on this exercise. And my boss, he was a new boss then, he put his mobile phone on the desk. He said, hey, Finn, I've just got to have a quick chat with this guy over here. If anyone calls, just answer that, will you? And uh, I went, yeah, yeah, no problem, boss. And I was busy doing something. We'd actually got someone on the range with a, with a, with a weapon snag. Uh, we're out on the west coast of the States in a, in a place called Yuma. Mm-hmm. That you might have seen uh, yeah. there's a film about yeah. Yuma, but we're in these massive ranges. And uh, the phone went. So I picked up the phone. I said, uh, hello, OC1 Squadron's phone. And uh, this person said, is that Squadron Leader Monaghan? I said, uh, yes. AOC1 Group wants to speak to you, who was a guy, and he had a really a bit larger than life character, really good man. And he just, uh, and a bit of a boomy type character, a bit like Trenchard, I guess. You know, he always knew he was in a room. And uh, and he said, hey, Monaghan, I've got two pages in front of me. It appears that you've got a DFC. <laughs> what have you got to say for yourself? And there was just silence at my end. I was like, now I knew exact at that moment, I knew exactly which mission this referred to. So yeah. it was pretty clear what it was. And uh, and I was the first Harry guy, actually, in Afghanistan to get one of these things. And, um, and there were only two, actually, um, uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, and I kind of, I, I was just silent. And he said, Monaghan, you are never silent. <laughs> this is the first time we've managed to shut you up. 
And, uh, and then he said, right, I'm off. And put the phone down. And I was kind of, I was in shell shock. And I said, uh, I've got a DFC. And he said, get off the desk. I'll take it. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't know what to do with myself now. I really didn't. And, and it, and the funny thing is, it uh, a DFC, one of my mates before me said it's a cross to bear. And, uh, and I said, what do you mean? And suddenly this thing hit me. Uh, people who've gone before who've had DFCs, you, you instantly think, am I worthy? Yeah. Um, anybody else on the squadron would have done exactly the same thing. Um, uh, does it measure up to DFCs of the past? Um, at the same time, you're immensely proud. You know, it's that Churchillian thing, you know, medals uh, shine, but they cast a shadow. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and subsequently, I, I still, they are really powerful. It's a piece of tin, right? Yeah. Mm. It's a little bit of ribbon. Mm. Oh, my God. The, the, and, you know, I'd love to know the, psych, the psychologist view of these. I, I've written about medals in my, um, in my yeah. PhD. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're like these things, you know, what is that? It's a piece of tin, isn't it? Or it's a piece yeah. of white material, but they really get into you. Finn, I want to ask you two quick questions to sign off on. Uh, the first question is, I always remember, I think it was a chef, Albert Roux, who said that he could tell pretty much anything uh, that he needed to know about a prospective would-be chef uh, at whatever level by the way they boiled an egg. Um, and I've always, uh, I've always been fascinated by that. So one question I wanted to ask you, if you had a fighter pilot who was at a certain level, I don't know, um, kind of making this up as I go along, and you could choose any plane that you've flown in to put them in, to put them through their paces, to see if they've really got what it takes, question. what would that plane be? Good question, Kevin. And Dutton. the second, thank you very much, Bruce. And the second question is, after all these skies that you've flown in for 30 odd years, if you were looking back at the young Finn Monaghan just joining the RAF from where you are now, what would you say to him? Two questions to finish off with Finn. Um, right. So the first one, uh, Harrier, um, because it, it tests everything. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a difficult aeroplane to fly. You can do so many different things with it. lots and lots of different circuit approaches. You can hover it, you can short land it, you can short take off the aircraft, you can land it on grass, you can land it in on concrete, you can land okay. it in a supermarket car park, things like that. You know? yeah. So that that would definitely be the uh, you know that's so the you need to be a bit of an all rounder, do you, to fly one of those in a kind of layman's terms? Is that be about right? Or? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, and and and, and yes, yeah, so, and 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 also there's there's a certain um, you, you are very much in touch with the aircraft. So particularly when you get into uh, um, into jet borne flight, so when you slow down and the wings are no longer working for you, um, you can very easily mess that up. You know, so if you're doing say 30 knots with it, if you if you get it wrong and you don't have the ball in the middle and the and the vane just in front of you, just like a helicopter, if you don't have them in the middle, you can flip the aircraft in a second. Um, in less than right, a second, okay. actually. So uh, you can get intake momentum drag, which will flip the aircraft and kill you straight away. Um, wow. So that okay. that is a you know it's a real testing aircraft. Um, yeah. and, and at the same time, an absolutely beautiful aircraft, and you can do incredible things with it. And now you know that that now lives on in the F thirty five. Now you know that's a hovering aircraft, but you know that's that's a little bit easier to fly. I understand because I, I won't get to fly that too old. Um, <laughs> yeah. What words would I have with myself? Um, back at the beginning i would probably kick myself a little bit earlier on the big one i think is uh work hard and work 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 to get yourself better and make sure you you know you think you know everything well then do sit down and do it again uh that that's the key i think Finn, sneaky sneaky very very last quick question every kind of club golfer if they're asked what course would you want to play on in the world always says uh the masters at augusta uh, is there a plane that managed to elude you? Is there a plane that you never flew that you thought that you think to yourself now, I would love to have had a bash at that? Um, or have you done them all? I, I would have loved to have flown. I would have loved to have flown the F sixteen, um, the F eighteen, and the F thirty five. I'm too old for the F thirty five. I will not be considered for that. And I've gone and gone, gone and got myself promoted. What an idiot! Um, <laughs> so I, I I would have loved to have flown those aircraft. Uh, Never got to fly them. I have flown in some great aircraft. I've flown the Mirage 2000. Um, I've flown in uh, all sorts of aircraft when I was going around the world examining other other air forces. 
Um, I think it just as a little thing, one of the one of the, the best moments I've had in an aircraft, or, or the most zany moment I've had in an aircraft, was in a in a T thirty three, an ancient T thirty three, really well maintained by the Pakistani Air Force, flying up in the um, uh, in the Swat Valley with these oh, yeah. massive yeah. mountains in this tiny aeroplane. Yeah. And I was with a, 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 an absolutely delightful flight lieutenant who was a bit mystified that this group, you know, he was, he was a bit taken aback that there was this group captain in the aircraft with him. And he was just brilliant. And we went flying around and it, there was such beauty out there. And I was flying in this aircraft that was so old that I was like, oh, I love this. You know, what, yeah. what a privilege. And they have nurtured those aircraft. But no one else flies them, I don't think. Ah, there's and they one. nurtured them so well. That, oh, is there who else flies? No, there's one. So Orland, you know the base in Orland, the NATO base in Orland in Norway? Yeah. Right. Yep. So my mate Tintin, he's now a colonel. He's now the commander of the F-35 unit, right? He, he was in Phoenix for two years learning the, how to fly the damn thing because the US didn't know. Um, so he was a major at the time and he was the WEPS officer for the Tiger Squadron there, the f 16s he has a personal yep. T-33, which is the Norwegian historic flight one. I went up there, and I went up there in this sneaky little jet that I used to fly, um, and I went up there with three cases of trooper, totally illegally, um, landed at Orland, dispatched the beer into the mess. We had a couple of beers, and the next day we went flying uh, on the low-level uh, course up in the mountains and the fjords in the T-33. And I'll never forget being upside down yep. Well, about 50 feet right way up above the deck. And then just as we went over the crest, he flipped it upside down and there was 1,500 feet of fjord right underneath you. Boom, straight into it. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah lovely. Yeah, yeah. Great aircraft, the T-33. Just don't over-rotate. Oh, yeah, it was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Phil, it's been fantastic having you on, mate. It really has. Um, Bruce, I know you've been well, looking Well, thanks. It's been great chatting. Been, no, been brilliant, mate. It's been fantastic. Fantastic. Cheers, Finn. Thanks, mate. Super. Well, thank you for being with us for another episode of Psycho Schizo Espresso. If you want to become a patron, then please do. Patreon.com uh, forward slash Psycho Schizo espresso and in the meantime just don't forget if you're watching us on whatever platform whether it's youtube or spotify or whatever don't forget to just uh, give us a little nudge if you like what we're doing and like us and that way more people will get to hear about it and we can spread the gospel of psycho schizo espresso i think bruce isn't it yeah the gospel, gospel of je ne sais quoi yeah the gospel of psycho schizo espresso folks you won't regret it well you might but it'd be too late by then anyway. So yeah. there you go. Help us spread help us spread the news. Yes.